our vision. Our vision uh, is to, re to release the spirit of revival and to raise up and equip Holy Spirit-led believers to do the work of the ministry. Yes. It's not just uh, about yeah. pastors and apostles and prophets and evangelists and, and teachers doing the work of the ministry. It's about all the saints going into their sphere and impacting the culture and not letting the culture impact us. You know, we're called to impact the culture, not the culture impacting us. And, and so that's really our heart. And, uh, and so uh, uh, let's just dig into the words. Let's go to Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4, we started a new series last week uh, talking about a revival of the word, the spirit, and power. You know, I believe that, that oftentimes, you know, over the, the course of, of, of many years, you know, over the 2,000 years, the church has gone through stages where, where we've separated the word from, from the spirit and, and, and the spirit from power and the word from power. And I don't know about you, but I'm done with just the word of God. I want the word of God with the spirit and with power. Amen. And that's really the heart of Jesus. Jesus was, 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 was you know, how many know Jesus was the word? Right? But the word alone could do nothing. Yeah. Jesus himself said that the word alone could do nothing. He himself could do nothing without the Holy Spirit and without power. And we're going to see how that manifests. And so we started this new series. And, and, uh, and last week we talked about the, the importance of the name, the name of Yeshua. You know that you know, oftentimes we, when we look up the name Jesus in, our, in, in, in the English uh, dictionary, it, it represents, you know, Jesus the Christ. That's what it says. You know, uh, but you know, but when we look up his name Yeshua in Hebrew, it means so much more. It's more than just you know that he's Jesus. It's more than that he's just Yeshua. The the, the word Yeshua comes from two words in the Hebrew. It comes from the word uh, uh, Yah, uh, which is where we get the word Yehovah, uh, which means self-existent one, and then and then it comes from a, another word called Yasha, so Yahshua and uh, or Yeshua. And, uh, and, and so that word Yasha literally means to, to defend, to avenge, to, to deliver, to save, to heal, to cure, to, 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 uh, to be, bring the victory, to make free, to make whole. You know, and so the name of Yeshua is above every other name. So whatever can be named in this society, whatever can be named in, you know, in disease or sickness, Jesus is above every other name. And every name must bow to the name of Yeshua. And, uh, and so we talked about that last week. But let's look at Acts chapter 4, starting in verse 29. It's really our, our word for this year. It's, our, it's our, the prophetic word God gave me uh, back in uh, September uh, uh, last year. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, how many know we're stepping in? In another month, we're going to step in uh, to a whole new Hebraic year. And I believe God's, you know, preparing something, and He's, and he's going to be bold with what He's preparing uh, in, in this next season that we're about to step into. Say, this season, this season is, done. is done. But God's taking us into a new season that is more glorious. Right? right, And you know, you can't look at circumstances to determine your, the gloriousness of God. You've got to look at the nature and character of God to declare over your situations and circumstances that they must bow to His name. And so in Acts chapter 4, starting in verse 29, it says, Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken or agitated, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. You know, I want to suggest that there, the reference here is really about the boldness of the spoken word, the boldness of the anointing, and the boldness of power. The early church was in revival, right? They were in revival. I mean, in the midst of persecution, they were in the midst of revival. Everybody say revival, revival. right? But see, see they, they, they were hungry for God. They were, you know, even, I mean, they were actually, in a, in a sense, really, when they prayed this prayer, they were actually calling for more persecution. Because the greater boldness they spoke, the greater persecution was going to come against them. And somewhere along the way, the church has gotten in this place where we, we, we don't want persecution. We don't want to let, but I'm here to tell you that persecution is here. And persecution is what's going to propel the church forward and bring us into a new dynamic of the power of God. Right? Because we need to rely on the Holy Spirit. We need to so rely on the Holy Spirit 
to bring revelation to us on the word so that we can operate in the power of God. So last week we discovered the character, the nature, and the authority of the name of Yeshua. We talked about Naomi's family, you know, uh, and, and how Naomi's family with her husband and, and her two sons, uh, Chilion and, 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 and um, uh, Malon, and, 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 they, and they left the place of Bethlehem. And, and the place of Bethlehem means the house of bread. And they left the house of bread because of a famine. And nowhere does it say that God led them to go. They left the house of bread so that, and went to an incestuous place. And Naomi and Ruth's, um, sorry, and Naomi's husband and two children died while in an incestuous place. She comes back. She brings Ruth back with her. And, uh, and Ruth chooses to go. Orpah, the other daughter-in-law, chooses to stay in the incestuous place. She comes back, and she and, and she comes back to because uh, she hears that, that that the famine's gone and the word of the Lord's coming out. And she goes back and she says, "People are hungry for her. They're they're looking for her. They're they're waiting for her." And uh, and she says, "No longer call me Naomi, but call me bitter. Call me Mara." In other words, she she because she had left the house of bread. She had left the place of sustenance. She had left the place of, of you know, see, whether there's a famine for the word or, a, uh, you know, we never leave the house of God. We never leave the house of bread. We never leave the sustenance that he wants to give us so that we can break through the famine. And, uh, and, and so they left. They went to this incestuous place. She comes back. She calls herself bitter. And she begins to say that the Lord had brought the affliction upon her. And I'm here to say that the Lord didn't bring the affliction upon her. She chose the affliction. She chose to bring the affliction upon her. And, and she gets a revelation that she's to come back. But she begins to misrepresent who God is. And so, and so I'm, here, I'm here to say that, that when we leave the house of bread, whether we're in a famine, and I believe the church is in a famine, I believe that the world is in a famine for, for the name and the character and the nature and the authority of Yeshua. And we've got to come back to the nature and the character of Yeshua so that we can operate out of the word, the spirit, and the power in a greater dimension. See, I, I, I believe that if we were to pull the church in North America... And say, who is Yeshua? We'd hear many responses. But I believe many of those responses would be void of the power of God. Many of those responses would be void of, of the Spirit of God. You know, I, I know there was a poll many years ago, back in the uh, uh, early 2000s, there was a poll done and, uh, to uh, the evangelicals in, in the States. And, 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 and the poll basically asked, you know, do you believe that the word of God is true. And, and about 60% of evangelicals said that the word of God was true. 60%. I mean, that tells us there's a famine in the land. There's a famine to know who Yeshua is and what he paid for. And I, I just want to encourage us tonight that, that, that Jesus, you know, holds all authority and all power. Right? I mean, it says that in Matthew chapter 28, right? You know, in Matthew 28, 18, it says, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Did you hear that? All authority. That means the devil has no power and no authority. Mm. Amen. Yeah. He has absolutely no power and no authority. He was stripped at the cross. He was stripped, right? How many would agree? Jesus, would, or Jesus stripped the devil of all power and all authority because Jesus took all power and all authority back. Amen. The only power the devil has is what we choose to give him. And we give him too much power. Right? You know, and we've got to stop giving him power. We've got to give power to the one who holds all authority and the one who holds all power. Right? You know, Yeshua, when he started his ministry, was never void of the Spirit and never void of power. Yeah. He was never void of it. He never, because the Word was never separated from the, from the Spirit and from power. At the birth of Jesus, we talked a little bit about this last week, flip over to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, and let's just highlight this for a minute, that, that it, in Jesus' birth conception, in his conception... We see the Word, the Spirit, and power in His conception, which means if it was in His conception, it was all the way through the birth and, and, and His childhood, all the way through into His ministry, 
and uh, you know, and into his death, it was the spirit, the word, and the power that Jesus lived from. He was never void of that power. Even on the cross, he was never void of the power because it was the Holy Spirit that gave him the power to get through the death, burial, and resurrection. Yeah. Right? You know, and so we, you know, when we look at this in Luke chapter one, look at this. It says in in uh, in verse uh, 31, it says, And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Yeshua. And he will be great and, and will be called the son of the highest. Everybody say the son, the son, of, the son of the highest. All right. Now flip down to verse 35. It says, And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, also that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. In other words, the Word, the Word of God. The, the Bible tells us in John chapter 1, verse 14, that the Word became flesh. So in other words, the Word, the Spirit, and power were there at the conception of Yeshua. And if they were at the conception of Yeshua, they were at the birth of Yeshua. Look at this, in, in verse 35. The power of the highest. Who's the highest? The Father, right? So in other words, Jesus was not absent of the Father, not absent of the Spirit, and not absent of the Word because he was the Word. Oh, hallelujah, right? So, so if, if, if Jesus, who is the Word of God, was not absent of power, and of the Spirit, what makes us think that we can divide the Word from the Spirit and power? And think that we can live the Christian life void of His power and void of His Spirit. Right? How many know the, the letter of the law kills? And the reason why the letter of the law kills is because it's void of the Spirit. Right? Right? It's void of the Spirit. In other words, we must have the Word, the Spirit, and power to fulfill the commission, to fulfill what God has called the church to. Right? Flip over to Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3. Look at this. So powerful. Right? You know, we're talking about revival of the Word, revival of the Spirit, and revival of, of power. And, uh, and we see here in, in, uh, in Matthew chapter 3, verse 16. We all, we all call John 3.16, but what about Matthew 3.16, right? Matthew 3.16, you know, is, is one of, you know, another one of my favorite passages. When he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were open to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Right? Go to chapter 4 for a minute, verse 1. It says, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Now, was he tempted as God or was he tempted as man? He was tempted as man because God cannot be tempted. Mm. Right? Right? You know, we're going we're to discover something here tonight. Right? Now, now, the Spirit descended like a dove and alighted himself upon Jesus. And the Father said, This is my Son of whom I'm well pleased. In other words, this is the direct reflection, a direct representation of who I am. And he's not void of who I am. He, he has the Spirit and he has power. Right? Think, think about it this way. If Jesus was led into the desert, right, or into the wilderness by the Spirit, he has the power to overcome. Mm -hmm. See, when we don't overcome sin, it's because we've separated the Word from power and the Word from the Spirit. So when we, we overcome sin when all three are working together within us because He's, he, you know, we have the power to say, I have, I have the, power the power to overcome. So now go to Luke chapter 4. Just kind of setting the stage here. 
Luke chapter 4, in verse 14, comes out of the wilderness and says, Then Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit. Everybody say, in the power, in the power. of the Spirit. the Spirit. Right? How many know Jesus said he's the way, the truth, and life? No man comes to the Father but by me. He said he was the bread of life. He said he was the Son of God, the Son of Man, the living Word, the living Torah, the Redeemer, the Healer, the Avenger, the Deliverer, the Victory, the Lord, the Savior. See, we can quote all those names, but do we really believe that he is who he says he is? Because if we really believe who he says he is, we'll walk accordingly to who he says he is and what he paid for, right? See, I believe we can quote many scriptures, but for many of us, they seem void of life and power. Yeah, come on. Right? I mean, I mean, I mean, you know, think about it. You know, we quote John 3, 16 so many times, but it's void of the power that God destined it for. The power wasn't so we could go to heaven. The power was so we could know him now and operate the way he operated. Yeah. Jesus said this. He said, he said you know, uh, when he breathed the Holy Ghost on, uh, on the disciples, he said, he said, peace I leave with you. And as the Father has sent me, so I send you. He said, you know, and, and the anointing that Jesus had is the same anointing that you and I have that we can carry into our spheres of influence and bring change to the world. Hallelujah. Yes. Hallelujah. I'm done with a, a church that's void of the power. I'm done with a church that's void of the spirit and void of the word. Right? We need all three in, 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 together in unison so that we can live the life he designed us to live. Go with me to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. Because Jesus said something. He, he said something so powerfully in John chapter 6 verse 63. He said this. He said, uh, I'll start at 62. It says, What then if you should see the Son of Man ascend where, where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. In other words, the words I speak are spirit and power. It's in essence what Jesus is saying. You know, because... Because, uh, I, I mean, think about it. Look, look what he says here. It is the Spirit who gives life. Mm -hmm. Say, it is the Spirit, the Spirit who, gives life. who gives life. In other words, the Word doesn't give life. Mm -hmm. Come on. The Word doesn't give life. Many people have read this Word and get no life out of it because it's void of the Spirit. When the spirit is attached to the word, yeah. there's power yeah. to over. There's power that gets released from the presence of God. Power for signs and wonders and miracles to take place. Power that we can overcome sin. Right? Oh, yeah. See, see how much value. Listen to this. How much value do you place on the word of God? But how much value do you place on the spirit of God? How much power do you, or a value do you place on the power of God? May I suggest something? We have valued the word more than we value the spirit and his power. The word, the spirit, and power must be valued the same. Not not you know uh, you know value the word eighty percent and I value the you know the, the spirit you know twenty percent and I value power well I don't value power right come on right right you know we, we, we are called to value the word the spirit and power at the same value because if you value any of them less you'll have less of all three. God values. That's right. You got to value what God values. Yes. God values. I mean, watch it. Oh, man. Go to Acts chapter 10. Let's see what God values. So what you're saying is the, the Bible says that they have a form of godliness but deny the power thereof. Absolutely. Yeah. You can have a form but deny the power. Right? And we're not called to have a form and deny the power. We're called to value all three because if we value all three, we'll see a change and a transformation. I believe the reason why we don't see the change in this culture, the way other cultures see it in other nations, is because we don't value the word, spirit, and power. We have valued the word, and we've actually, in some ways, we value the culture more than we value the word, spirit, and power. 
I know that might hurt, but it's true. Right? Now watch this. Look at Acts chapter 10, verse 38. How much does God value the word spirit and power? Well, he tells us in verse 38 how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. That's the value God put on the word, the spirit, and the power. <laughs> oh, Jesus. We need so much of this. We need to recognize that, that we need all three and to value all three because God values all three. He never left the word without the spirit and power. Hmm. Right? So, so he says, how God anointed. So in other words, how the Father anointed Jesus of Nazareth with Holy Spirit and with power. So in, watch this. How he anointed him with the Spirit and with the highest. Mm. Oh. <laughs> in other words, Jesus was God in the flesh completely. Yeah. Anointed with spirit and with I love it because there's a distinction between the two it's not just anointed with the spirit mm -hmm. it's anointed with the spirit and power mm -hmm. see if power was left out mm -hmm. then the highest wouldn't be a part of everything Jesus mm. Jesus only did what he saw the father because the father was the highest and the father is the power yeah. right yes and if the power was left out the world would rule but the world doesn't rule because jesus christ god almighty has the power to overcome all things because he's he has all authority and mm -hmm. all power mm -hmm. right he has all authority and all power so so the key is is do we believe it yes. right do we believe it watch this yeshua the word of god was clothed Endued, anointed, smeared, rubbed with, furnished with, Holy Spirit and with power. Luke, the writer of the book of Acts and, and the writer of, of the book of Luke, makes a distinction here between Holy Spirit and power. Now we know Luke was a, was a physician. He was a doctor. And, 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 and think about this. He's a doctor and he's emphasizing the Spirit and power. Yeah, yeah. I want to suggest we've got to get out of of just listening to a doctor and start listening to the word, the spirit, and power. Amen. Right? Amen. It's time we got to get back to the real reality of Yeshua and come to the reality of the word, the spirit, and power. Mm. Oh, that'll just shake a few things. Yeah. <laughs> right? This means that Yeshua was anointed by the Spirit and with the power of the highest. Oh, how we need a revival of the Word. Oh, how we need a revival of the Spirit. Oh, how we need a revival of power. But I don't know about you, but I don't want to go another day without the power, the Spirit, and the Word of God. And that's what the apostles in Acts chapter 4 the, in the first century church was asking for. They were asking for a revival of the Word. And they were in the midst of the Word. They were in the midst of the Spirit. And they were in the midst of power. And they were asking for more. Yeah. Right? It's not wrong to ask for more. I believe God's waiting on the church to ask for more. Right? He's waiting on us and then to go do something with what we've been given. Right? Oh, hallelujah, Jesus. Right? Right? I, uh, I just wrote this down. Lord, I desire that every word that I read, every word that I speak from the word is furnished and clothed with your Holy Spirit and clothed with your power, that it would accomplish what you sent it to accomplish. I'm hungry for your word. I'm hungry for your spirit. And I'm hungry for your power. A hunger to be in union with all three. Your word, your spirit, and your power. Lord, let us not divide your word from your spirit and from your power. Yeah. Flip over back over to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. Are you good tonight? Yes. <laughs> Man, I, yeah. I just want more of Yeshua. I want more of his word. I want more of his power and more of his spirit. Luke chapter 1. In the Amplified. In the Amplified version. I love this because in the Amplified version it says this. For with God, 
Nothing is ever impossible, and no word from God shall be without power or impossible of fulfillment. In other words, there in the Amplified is breaking out that passage of Scripture. I'll read it in the, in the New King James, uh, and this is what it says in verse 37. It says, it says, For with God nothing will be impossible. Right? Nothing will be impossible. Right? So, if the, so when the Amplified breaks that down into, for with God nothing is ever impossible, and no word from God shall be without power or impossible of fulfillment. Think about it. Abraham. Right? Before, you know, Abram gets a word from God. You're going to, you know, you're going to have a son. And, you know, you're going to be a father of many nations. And, and you know, he comes through this promise. And, and, uh, and, you know, his name gets changed to Abraham. And, of course, Sarai is changed to Sarah. And, and, and how many know the two of them come together in the midst of, of an impossible situation? Yeah. She's past childbirth. Mm-hmm. Right? And so is he. Mm-hmm. Right? She's past childbirth, and so is he. And without the Word, the Spirit of God, notice their names were changed from Abram to Abraham, and Sarai to Sarah, which is that letter H in the Hebrew is the letter H, and it literally means breath or spirit. So in other words, the Word of the Lord, the Spirit of God, and the power to conceive was there. No word from God lacks the power yeah, no. to fulfill what He is destined to fulfill. So without the Spirit and the power, they would have been left with just the word. Yes, mm-hmm. exactly. Alone. Mm-hmm. And no fulfillment. And no fulfillment. Yep. Yes. You need all three. Yeah. Right? And yet, and yet, you know, how, how many of us, you know, all of us, in some ways, in a fashion in our life, we've lived separating the Word from the Spirit and the power, yeah. right, in different aspects of our life. But I believe the Lord's just, you know, raising this up to say, listen, it's time to come back and to value all three. Thank you, Lord. Right? I, I, I just, I remember when God showed me this a year ago, you know, and He said to me, if the Word of God could do nothing, the Word Himself, Jesus, could do nothing without Holy Spirit and power. What makes the church think it can be void of power and void of the Holy Ghost baptism amen, amen. and fulfill the Great Commission? It's impossible. Right? Because we need to value all three. So, when we look at this passage in, in Acts chapter 10, 38, where it says how God anointed Jesus Christ of Nazareth, what it literally means is that God clothed Jesus. He clothed the Word with the Holy Spirit. What did He clothe Him with? The Holy Spirit. He clothed Him with the determination, the thoughts, and the emotions of God himself. Yes. How do you think Jesus walked in compassion? By the Spirit. Yeah. Remember, Jesus could do nothing of himself. Yeah. Which means he couldn't even have compassion. Mm-hmm. Think about it. The Old Testament. When you read the Old Testament, right? How many, how many you know, you read and you think God was different back then? Mm-hmm. Right? He wasn't. He was the same. Right? But when we read the word outside of the Spirit, we'll read it from a place where, that says the Father had no compassion. But he had, he had lots of compassion for people. Right? I mean, think, think about Noah. You know, Noah, you know, he gets Noah to build the ark and, and it takes Noah how many years? Anybody know? Approximately 120 years. Approximately. 
But what we don't realize is that Noah, for a hundred years, preached righteousness. The book of Peter tells us that he preached righteousness for a hundred years. Think about that. Yeah. And we think God's that you know in the Old Testament is different. No, God had compassion on the people, and He got a man. He got a man to preach righteousness to a people who God knew would not turn. Talk about a compassionate God, right? So here's Jesus. Jesus gets anointed with the ability to have compassion by the Spirit. Because he's filled with the, the emotions of the, of, of the Spirit of God. He's also filled and furnished with the will, the determination. How do you think Jesus could, could do the um, um, Garden of Gethsemane? How, how, did he, how did he do the Garden of Gethsemane? He did it because, right, he had the empowerment of the Spirit. He had the ability and the determination of the Spirit of God to submit to the will of God. Right? Right? So he's furnished with that. Right? And then he's furnished with the thoughts of God. The intents of God. And then he gets furnished with power, which is the ability to act, to, to, to perform miracles, to, to have strength, to have force, to, to operate in supernatural abilities. How many want that? Well, we have that. The key is, is are we living in it? Right? See, see if, you, if you don't step into it, you won't function in it. you got to step into it. Flip over to Psalm 119. Psalm 119. This is probably one of my favorite psalms. It's the longest psalm. But there's so much in this psalm. And what we discover in this psalm Nine times in the King James Version, it says, quicken me. Nine times in, in, in the New King James, it says, revive me. It's the same word. But this word quicken in Hebrew means to revive. It means to live, make alive, to give the promise of life, to nourish up, to preserve, to recover, to restore, and to make whole. But it can also mean to declare or show. In other words, revive the word so that I may show it. Revive the spirit so I may show him. Revive the power so I may demonstrate who he is. Right? You know? So, so let's look at this. Psalm 119, verse 25. It says, My soul clings to the dust. Revive me according to your word. Now this is found in, in, uh, uh, in the, uh, um, under the, the, the letter Dalit uh, in Hebrew, which is the letter for heart. Uh, you know, it's the fourth uh, letter of the Hebrew alphabet. It really uh, speaks of the heart. And, uh, and so, so when, when the, the writer says, my soul clings to the dust, what's he saying? My soul is clinging to carnality. It's clinging to, to something that's not you, right? It, it, it's clinging to humanistic thought. It's clinging to humanistic reason and, and uh, uh, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's what it's clinging to. And, and, and the writer, which possibly could be David or it could be Ezra, and, and, and we begin to discover here, he says, you know, so here's my soul clinging to the dust, but Lord, revive me according to your word. And the Lord, revive me out of carnal ways. Revive me out of car carnal thinking, humanistic thinking that denies the power and the spirit of God. Do you know that humanistic thought denies the power and denies the spirit of God mm -hmm. and denies the ability of the word? Right? It's totally opposite. Right? And, 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 and so, how many know the devil eat, has been eating dust since, since the fall of man and has gone from a serpent into becoming a dragon? Yeah. Because we, we've been feeding off dust instead of feeding off the word. Right? Now, 
He says, revive me. It's normal, in other words, quicken me according to what? To your word. Watch this. Revive me according to Yeshua. Yeshua is the word. In other words, we, we, we can honestly say, revive me according to Yeshua. Because Yeshua is the word. And if Yeshua is the word, that means the word, spirit, and power go along with that. Because Jesus was never void of the word, spirit, and power. Right? So in other words, revive me according to to your word, to your spirit, and to your power. Right? Verse 26 says, I have declared my ways, and you answer me. Teach me your statutes. Make me understand the way of your precepts, so I shall meditate on your wonderful works. My soul melts from having to strengthen me according to your word. Strengthen me, not according to just the word. Strengthen me according to your word, your spirit, and your power, so that I'm not void of any of it. The reason why I'm, you know they were feed, you know he was feeding on dust is because he was void of something. He was void. You know, you were, when we feed off of of uh, humanistic thought or the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it's because we're void. We're void of going after. We're li- we're in him, and we're not going after the right food. Mm. Go to verse thirty-seven. Verse thirty-seven says. Turn away from my turn turn away my eyes from looking at worthless things and revive me in your way. <clears throat> Another translation um, says, revive me uh, in your words. Right? Which you know Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the Life, In other words, revive me back to your word, revive me back to your power, and revive me back to your spirit. In essence, that's what he's saying, right? Turn away my eyes from looking. How often do we look at worthless things, (laughs) right? And our eyes get focused on the worthless things rather than focused on the one who has the ability to bring us up and out of every situation. See, what, what, what's your soul clinging to? What's your mind clinging to? What, what are your emotions clinging to? What are you beholding? Right? Turn away my eyes from looking at worth. See, in other words, what are we beholding? Do we really behold the word, the spirit, and the power? That's a challenge. I don't know about you, but that's a challenge in our culture. You know, it's a challenge, you know, even in the season that the world's in right now. It's a challenge to, to, you know, do we, are we upholding the word, the spirit, and power? Or are we living out of fear? Or are we living out of worry? Or are we living out of anxiety? Or are we living out of other things? Right? And, and, and I believe the writer's saying, listen, turn my eyes away. What's, wor- what's a worthless thing? Fear. Worry. Stress, dysfunction, trials, situations. Get our gaze off of those things and put our gaze on the one. Right? Put our gaze on Yeshua, who is the avenger, who is the defender, who is the the, the peace, who is the, the cure, who is the... Right? You know, <laughs> there was a study done uh, a few years ago uh, asking... Um, thousand pastors in, in, in the uh, states, they asked this question do you believe that the word of God has, has all the answers for the world's problems? And 100% of them said yes. They asked the next question was, are you preaching that the word of God holds all the answers to the problems? And about 10% out of the thousand polled wow. said that. They were preaching it. Our problem is, is we have a famine of the word. We have a famine of power. We have a famine. Mm-hmm. It's mm-hmm. void of the spirit and power and the word of God. Right? And God's reviving that. How many want that revived? Right? See, verse 40. Go to verse 40. 
He says, Behold, I long for your precepts. Revive me in your righteousness. In other words, quicken me. Make me alive. Bring life uh, you know, in, into the areas of my walk. Bring, bring areas that, that I may walk like Yeshua walked. Here's the question for you. Can we walk like Yeshua walked? Yeah. Because we have, right? We're anointed, right? We're anointed with the Word. We're anointed with the Spirit. And we're anointed with power, which means we have the ability. Let me say it this way. God has not given us just His Word. Mm -hmm. Amen. He's given us His Word, His Spirit, so that, may we, that we can actually do what we could not do, right, on our own. And He gave us the power to be able to display who He is. So we have the ability to walk in the Word, the ability to walk in the Spirit, and the ability to walk in power. He, man, verse, go to verse 88. Verse 88. Look what it says. It says, Revive me according to your loving kindness, so that I may keep the testimony of your mouth. Quicken me according to what? Your love. Quicken me according to your nature, your character, your authority. <clears throat> Quicken me. Make me alive. Bring the promise of life to me. So that I may keep or guard the testimony of your mouth. What's the testimony of his mouth? His word, his spirit, and his power. Right? It's the same thing the disciples were asking for in Acts chapter 4, verse 29. That we may speak the word of God with boldness, and that you may stretch out your hand, that, uh, that your signs, wonders, and miracles may be done through your, uh, your holy child and servant, Jesus. Right? Mm. Verse 107. Verse 107 says, I'm afflicted very much. Come on, how many times, you know, we feel afflicted? Right? Right? Says, but, but look what the writer says. I'm afflicted very much, so revive me, O Lord, according to your word. According to your word, spirit, and power. Right? In other words, revive my afflictions. You know, revive me that I may encounter your word, your spirit, and your power. Right? It's time to stop living from our affliction and start living from the word, spirit, and power. Yeah. <laughs> right? I mean, and that's what it comes down to. Look at verse 149. Verse 149 says this. It says, Hear my voice according to your loving kindness. O Lord, revive me according to your justice. Right? So what is your voice speaking? <laughs> now, I, 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 somebody had put this thing on Facebook, and I, and I kind of watched briefly a bit of it. I, I don't didn't really agree with it, but I wa watched a little bit, and you know, when the person was talking about, you know, how, you know, uh, you know, the New Age movement, and you know, how it's all on good, you know, good words and and good thought, and let's just say, well, well, we have something better. Yeah. We have the Word of God, and if I speak the Word of God, and it's and it's and it's valued just as much as His Spirit and His power, then what I speak will manifest. What I speak will take place because it's not void. Of the power of God. It's not void of the Spirit. Right? How many want to get to that place? Jesus was at that place. Right? And he didn't do it at that place because he was God. He did it as man in right relationship with the Word, the Spirit, and the power to demonstrate to you and I how we were to walk in the Word, Spirit, and power. Amen? Amen? Right? So, verse 154. It says, plead my cause and redeem me. Revive me according to your word. Well, we can say from this, this end, this side of the cross, we can say, revive me according to the cross of Calvary. Mm -hmm. Revive me according to what you paid for. What did you pay for? Sin, sickness, disease, poverty. He paid for it all. He paid for the curse, right? 
He redeemed us from the curse. So, so, so in other words, plead my cause what, what, you know, and redeem me. In other words, Lord, this is what you died for, right? And I recognize this is what you died for. So, Lord, revive me according to your word, your spirit, and your power. I wrote this down. The cross revived the word, the spirit, and the power in us. So we could walk the way he destined us to walk. I, I, I also jotted this down, the, which I talked about before. The devil was stripped of all power. The only power the devil has is what we give him. So why... Do we in the church think that the devil has any ability to create anything? He only counterfeits what God has already established. Think about this. There's a hierarchy of angels in, in the kingdom of God. How many would agree? Right? There's a hierarchy. So what does the devil do? He created, right? Or counterfeited, I should say. He counterfeited a hierarchy of demonic structures based on what God had already created. Mm -hmm. Right? There's powers, there's principalities, there's rulers. Right? Okay, so there's different right, dimensions, right? Now, so if the devil has counterfeited what God has already established, do you not think the devil is trying to counterfeit everything that's available to the church today? Right? He's, he's counterfeited even the power of God. He's counterfeited the gifts of the Spirit. Right? Fortune tellers yeah. is a counterfeit of the right. prophetic. Yeah. Right? Which is why when fortune tellers get saved, they, they have a prophetic call. Why? Yeah. Because they understand the things in the realm of the Spirit. Yeah. That's why you can't go to Africa and tell the African people who have come out of the witch doctors and say, well, you know, the supernatural just doesn't exist, you know. Uh -huh. No, they know the supernatural exists because they've been on the dark side. Now they flip over to the right side and begin to live it by the Spirit of God. They begin to live yeah. in the Spirit and the power of the Word, yeah. which is why more power and more miracles and signs and wonders take place in nations like Africa and the nations yes, of sir. Africa and those nations is because they understand the realm of the demonic. They understand the hierarchy that's in the demonic, that it's just a counterfeit to what God has already established. And we, the church, have got to catch up. Why do you think there's so many movies and stuff on zombies and vampires and, and all these other things, supernatural paranoia yes. and, 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 and all this sort of stuff? Why? It's because the church isn't manifesting the correct supernatural realm. Amen. Right? The supernatural realm of God, which is because we've separated power and the Spirit from the Word of God. I mean, I, you read testimonies. I mean, I don't know if you know uh, Mariah Woodworth Edder. She was yes, from back in the 1800s. And man, she would preach. I mean, she was a mighty preacher. And, and she would preach, and she'd go into trancers for five to... You know, hours to, to I, I think uh, one was like even 24 hours. She was in a trance and she was ministering all in different places during that trance. And people would stay and then people would leave and they'd come back and still see her in this, in, 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 a, in a motionless state. And then she'd come out and she'd just continue preaching the word of God. And here we think the devil's done stuff like that. Listen, I'm here to tell you that he's just counterfeited it. You can't go into a trance on your own. you got to let the Spirit of God take you into a trance, but it'll never take you into a trance if you're not open to it. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'll say it another way. Jesus levitated. Amen. <laughs> Church has, you know, we, we, we've so given power to the enemy that you can't levitate on your own. You gotta, it, it's the Spirit of God. How did Jesus levitate? Well, the disciples watched him ascend. That's right. Mm -hmm. They watched him. Think about it. They watched him levitate. And somewhere the church has gotten messed up. Now, now I'm here to tell you that you can't do that on your own. If you're trying to do it on your own, you're not doing it by the Spirit of God. But if you allow the Spirit of God, and you, and you hunger for the Spirit of God, and if He wants you to levitate, He'll cause you to levitate. I know a preacher, he went to walk off the, uh, or I know of a preacher, and he went to walk off the stage. And as he went to walk off the stage, the Lord co covered him, and he didn't fall off. He was able to walk right back. It's phenomenal, right? All right. So if the Spirit of God wants to do it, He'll do it, right? Right. You can't do it on your own. You can't manufacture it on your own. He takes you into it. 
But if the church isn't open to that and thinks it's the devil, the devil couldn't create it even if he tried. He's been empowered too much. Which is why we, we, we see, you know, the demonic realm manifesting more than we see the Spirit of God manifesting. Say, it's changing. It's changing. It's changing. Hallelujah. Are you good? Yes. Yeah. Hallelujah. Right? First 156. I probably just messed up a whole bunch of people on that one, but but let me tell you, it's time to get it's time to get the word, spirit, and power together, right? Right? That's how Jesus lived. That's how I want to live. And if Jesus lived that way, so can we. Hallelujah! I've known Jesus walked through crowds of people. Yes, that's right. In other words, he walked right through the people. The crowds were so thick. That the Bible says that they were, remember, I don't know if you remember, the, I don't remember the exact location, but they were trying to throw him off a cliff. Yeah. Do you yeah. remember? And the Bible says that he walked through the people. Yeah. In other words, the Spirit of God caused him to walk through the people. Mm-hmm. And they did not even see him walk through them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he walked through walls. Now, I'm not here to tell you, you know, just go try to, you know, smash through a wall, right? But I'm here to tell you that if the Spirit of God wants you to walk through a wall and He needs you to walk through it, you'll walk through a wall. <laughs> but you got to be open to it, <laughs> right? Peter walked on water, right? Now, I'm not saying go try to walk on water out there, but what I am saying is if the Lord tells you or gives you a word to go do something, if you go and do it, you'll have the ability. Why? Because you've not separated the Spirit, and the Word, and the power. You've valued was, all three. It was Philip, wasn't it, that walked through time? Yes. That when he appeared to the, um, the eunuch? eunuch? Yep, absolutely. We've experienced that. We've experienced being <laughs> translated. Right? Now it was only a short time, but it was a translation of about, we figure about 20 minutes is what we figure. We were driving, and it was an hour drive to get from where we needed to go, and we were there in half an hour. 20 minutes or half an hour, something like that. We were there. And I didn't go in speed, I didn't, you know, all that other stuff. Right? We were exhausted, and we were tired, and we just, we were just, the Lord just took us. Right? Now I've heard stories of people being translated, you know, they go into a bathroom in the airport. And, and, and they come out of the bathroom and they're in a whole other country, a whole other place on the other side of the world. Mm-hmm. If God wants to do that, I'm open to that. <laughs> Man, <laughs> that would save money on travel and, and saves 18 hours of flying and 25 hours of flying. But, but you got to be open to it, yes. right? If the Spirit of God's leading you, then, then go for it, right? Now, verse 159. Verse 159 says this. It says, consider how I love your precepts. Revive me, O Lord, according to your loving kindness again. Right? See, how many of us need a revival of his living word? Mm-hmm. Right? How many of us need a revival of the Holy Spirit? And, yeah. and how many of us need a revival of his power? I don't know about you, but I think everyone does. Mm-hmm. Flip over quickly. We'll finish up here tonight in John chapter 7. John chapter 7. And we'll catapult into, into what I believe the Spirit of the Lord is saying. Uh, Next week, we'll go a little bit deeper. John chapter 7 and verse 38. Very familiar passage. It says, He who believes in me, as the scriptures has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Think about this for a minute. He who believes on who? On Yeshua. Okay? Now remember, Jesus himself could do nothing. So he who believes on the Word, the Spirit, and power. Not just the Word. Because you gotta, now you've got to bring Acts 10, 38. How God the Father anointed Jesus Christ of Nazareth, who went about doing good... Right? With Holy Spirit and power, who went about doing good, destroying the works of the devil, for God was with him. Mm-hmm. Right? So when Jesus is making this statement, he's making it under the anointing and making a statement. If you believe, because how many know the Pharisees believe the word? Yeah. 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 
They were just void of the Spirit. Right? So Jesus isn't talking about just the Word itself. He's talking about the Word, Spirit, and power. He who believes on me, as the Scriptures have said, because the Scriptures never separate the Word, the Spirit, and the power. All through Scripture, every, every promise that God, that God brought through His people, every promise He you know, brought through, you know, whether it be Noah, whether it be uh, Abraham, whether it be um, uh, Isaac or Jacob or, or King David or, or any of the prophets, all that He, that he spoke to, any promise that, that was ever there, it had the Word, the Spirit, and the power. Even them coming, think, think about this, the Israelites came out of Egypt. How did they come out of Egypt? By a word, by the Spirit, and by His power. In other words, they weren't even void. But here, here's the problem. They thought they were void of it. <laughs> because they, that, that's what they thought. I mean, the Bible tells us, Nehemiah chapter 9, if you want the passage, in Nehemiah chapter 9, I believe somewhere around verse 25, 26, it says this. It says that how God uh, sent the good spirit, yeah. which is the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. He sent them. And, he, and, and how many know when, when, when they came to the Red Sea, what did, what did Moses do? He parted the Red Sea with what? The power of God. The word, the spirit and power. So when they go to, to send the spies into the land, into the promised land, Right? Think about this in Numbers, right? 13. Where they send the spies into the land. Two came back with the word, the spirit, and the power. The other ten came back with what? Yeah. Interesting, isn't it? Well, yeah, surely the land flows with milk and honey. Look at its fruit. They came back with the word, but it was void. Of the power and of the spirit. Whereas Joshua and Caleb came back and they're like, we got the word, we got the spirit, and we got the power. Right? Because God was with them. Right? So, so tonight, what value do you place on the word? What value do you place on the spirit? And what value do you place on this power? Because the value you place, if it's not equal, if it's not 100% value of the word, 100% value of the, of the spirit, 100% value of, the, of power, then we need to get it to where it's 100% of all. So that we're not void of his power, we're not void of his word, and we're not void of his spirit. So let's pray. Father, I... I thank you for this word tonight. Yes. Father, I thank you that even as I've been meditating through this week and, and, uh, and just seeking you and recognizing that, Lord God, that there are areas in my own life where I've been void of the Spirit and void of your power. Lord, I'm acknowledging for myself, and I believe I'm acknowledging for each and every one of us those areas. And Lord, I, I'm, I'm asking, Lord, and just even as, as we read in Psalm 119, revive us, O Lord according to your word, according to your spirit, and according to your power. That, Lord God, that the words that we speak, just as Jesus spoke, that they were spirit and life, that every word that we declare will be spirit and life, because our gaze is upon you. Our mindsets are upon you. Our wills are upon you. So we may walk as Jesus walked, according to Acts 10, 38. It said how God the Father anointed Jesus Christ of Nazareth with Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good. Father, I'm just calling right now, I'm asking that we would be a people who value the Word, the Spirit, and power equally. And we become in unison because that's the Godhead. And as the apostles prayed, and the first century church prayed in Acts chapter 4, verse 29, 
and we would speak the word of God with boldness. And she would stretch out your hand, which means I gotta stretch out mine. Because my hand is his hand. My mouth is his mouth. And we have the same spirit, we have the same power, and the same word that Jesus had. So Father, I'm asking, go through this week Lord reveal those areas to us where we've not valued your spirit we've not valued your power or we've not valued your word that we may walk in a whole new dimension and grow and develop our relationship with the word our relationship with the spirit and our relationship with the highest the power of the highest in the mighty and powerful name we declare that we receive Lord Father, we choose to walk and destroy the works of the devil. Wherever we go, that we would bring reformation to our spheres of influence. To your to the glory be to you. And all the honor and praise in the mighty and powerful name of Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Be blessed, be encouraged. We look forward to seeing you next Sunday night, six o'clock. Uh, Tuesday night Bible study is canceled this week. We'll resume. Uh, starting uh, the first week in September, uh, or the following week in September, which I believe is September the 8th. So we'll start that at six or 7 o'clock here at the house, 125 Blackburn Drive, uh, on the 8th of September. And uh, we'll be back to you Sunday night, 6 o'clock, here at 125 Blackburn Drive. We encourage you to come out. You know, those that are online, you're welcome to watch online. We, we invite you to come to the house and uh, gather together in the power and the presence of God. In the mighty name of Jesus. God bless you. We look forward to seeing you.